Hey, thank you guys for being here tonight. I know we got a few new faces in the room. And then some faces that have probably been here for a long time. But let me catch you all up to speed. Uh, tonight we are actually ending our sermon series called Church Words. That's right. Uh, so just real quick, this has only been four weeks. I'll tell you what the first three weeks were about. The first week we talked about church. Can I see that first slide? We talked about this, that church is a people, not a place. You don't go to church. You are the church. I did that message. It was all about what the church is because, of course, the churchiest word of all church words is church. And if you are a believer in Christ, then you are the church now. All right. And then after that, my friend Tim Blake, is he, where did he go? He just disappeared. Uh, Tim Blake talked about revelation. And we said revelation really simply is that God speaks. When we talk about revelation here at the church or really any believers talking about revelation, it is the idea that God is speaking to us. And then last week, I wasn't here because I was super sick, but you guys got a bonus message from Tim Blake all about worship, which makes sense because this dude leads us in musical worship all the time. So uh, we talked about good worship is, let's see that, our whole life response to God. So it's not just when we stand, it's not just when we sing songs, but it is our whole life response as believers to worship God, to praise him, all right? And then tonight, we're going to be talking about another church word. It is this, saved. We are talking about what it means to be saved. Some of you know this already. If you have our church app, I sent out a notification asking you guys what it meant to be saved. And the thing about this word that's kind of interesting is I don't really think that this word sounds all that churchy just by itself, right? We're pretty familiar with the idea of somebody being saved from something, uh, but when we hear it in a church context, when we hear somebody say a sentence like, Jesus saved me, suddenly, if you're like, man, I've never been around Christians, I've never been to church, suddenly that is going to sound like a really churchy phrase, and it inevitably uh, leads us to wondering, what does that even mean? So, uh, before we go any further, I just want to remind you guys, the idea of this series, Church Words, is that is not that when you come into this place, you need to sound a certain way, look a certain way, act a certain way, but the idea is instead that if, as believers, we have common language about our God, then we will be able to communicate with one another, and that there's this beautiful unity that, where we can worship Him, uh, and we will know how to explain our faith uh, and we will be able to do that together. So that's been kind of the idea behind church words. Uh, and if you, if this is your first night, honestly, I never like to say that like one night is more important or that a message is, is better or different or whatever. But what I will say is that tonight's message and the idea of being saved is really one of the most life-altering, the most life-altering truths that we ever talk about, not just in this series. So anyways... Let's go back to the idea where I asked you guys what you thought it meant to be saved. I have some of your responses right up here on the screen. Uh, one of the first ones, and one of my favorites, was I think of the lyric, Hell lost another one, I am free. That's from uh, a song called I Thank God. That's right. Uh, Hell lost another one, I am free. And that's what that person thinks of when they think of being saved. Another person said, saved means that you found Jesus and he saved you from being lost. Another person said, being saved is what happens when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And then somebody said, someone helping you with something in life, that kind of goes towards the idea that just the word saved doesn't really sound all that churchy. You can be saved by someone helping you in some other way. And then the last one, getting saved happens when you trust Jesus. And I think there's a lot of really, really good stuff in all of those answers. If you contributed to that, I'm really grateful for you. And honestly, this is a great foundation for where we're going to start tonight. Now, there's probably some people in the room sitting here right now thinking, I would say I'm saved, so I think I understand what this is all about. I don't think this message is probably for me. It's probably for that person across the room. You know, they do not act saved. It's probably for that person. I promise you that tonight there is something in here for everyone. And I think we're going to really go deeper into what it means to be saved and how God is doing that, what he is saving us from, and what a whole life full of salvation means for us as believers. All right, so here is a big truth that's going to get us started for tonight. We're going to jump right into this. And it's this, Christians are saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. Christians are saved, we are being saved, 
and will be saved. If you take notes, you should write that down. That's really going to be kind of our foundation, our launching point for the rest of the things that we learn tonight. But before we go any further, I think it's important that we just take a second to learn what the word saved even means. You all know that I like to throw some Greek words at you when I can, uh, and this is going to be a fun one. Don't put it on the screen yet. Uh, so Greek, if you're, unfam- if you're like, man, why is this dude talking about a foreign language? The New Testament What we're going to be reading from a lot tonight is uh, originally written in Greek. And so it's in a different language, and it's important that we try to figure out what people were writing about when they wrote it in their language. And that's why we're going to look at this Greek word. You can go ahead and throw it up there. It's pronounced sozo. I like to put the Greek up there because it reminds me, like, trying to read a foreign language is really difficult sometimes. But that word is just pronounced sozo. Turn to the person to your right and say sozo. To your left. Go ahead. Now to your right say so, and to your left say zo, and to your left say zo, and to your right say so. Now say, I don't know, just say so-so again. I, I'm going to trip myself up. <laughs> Anyways, sozo, sozo, man, that is fun. Sozo is the Greek word that we translate to, in our English Bibles, the word saved, all right? And it means to save, to keep safe to preserve, and to rescue from danger. I'm going to say that again. Sozo, the Greek word where we get, uh, in our translations, we have, we have that translated as the word saved. It means to save, to keep safe, to preserve, or to rescue something from danger. Tonight we are going to look specifically at how God has saved us, how he is saving believers right now, and how he will save believers in the future. All right? So uh, let's do this. To set up this idea of being saved, the first thing we have to do is realize that we need saving. If we go back to that definition, it's that we're being rescued. It's that we are in danger right now, and we need to be saved. Without a need for it, this whole thing doesn't really matter. So we're going to be reading a lot of stuff that this dude named Paul wrote. Has anybody in here ever heard of the Apostle Paul? I promise a lot of you have, all right? So the Apostle Paul wrote this in Romans chapter 3. It's going to be on the screen. You guys can turn there if you want. But let's listen to this. As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. I don't think this one is on any Hobby Lobby signs. I don't think many people are getting this one tattooed. I don't think this is going to be in your grandma's kitchen. All right, this is probably not the most popular Bible verse, but nonetheless, it is true, and it is our foundation for the idea that every single person in this room, all 100 plus of us, need saving because none of us, none of us are righteous. Every person has sinned, and sin is simply when we disobey and turn away from God. It's when we do the things that God does not want us to do, and when we don't do the things that he has told us to do. And what that means is really that all of us have sinned. And sometimes in our, in my, in our heads, at least in my head, I won't speak for all you guys, when I hear that, that all of us have sinned, it ends up making me think, well, then maybe it's not that bad right? Nobody's perfect. All of us are going to make mistakes, so maybe it's not that big of a deal. But that's a lie. I'll tell you why. The, The Bible tells us that the wages of sin, what our sin deserves, is death. And not just a physical death, but a spiritual death. And what that means is that we will only be deserving of one thing, an eternity separated from God, a spiritual death because of the sin that all of us, every single one of us, have chosen over God. That is why we need saving. That is the basis for every single person in this room needing saving. But luckily, that is not where God leaves us. He does not leave us in that place, and that takes us to where we are tonight. I'm going to read some verses that I'm sure you guys have heard multiple times, but Man, I've, been, I've reread these verses several times in preparation for this message, and it's crazy how something you've heard maybe your whole life might hit you in a new way tonight. So listen to this verse. This comes from Ephesians 2. This is verses 8 and 9. It says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may 
boast. I'm going to read one part of that again. For by grace you have been saved. Those who are Christians in this room tonight have been saved. That's past tense. If you have already placed your faith in Jesus, then the grace he offers has already saved you. You have been saved by grace through faith if you have put your faith in Jesus. Jesus. This is past tense. The saving has already happened if you have put your faith in Jesus. There's a theological term that we use for this. I didn't want to give you 17 church words tonight, but if you're like a real note taker, you're really trying to figure out what this stuff means. This is a theological term that we call justification. Justification is the act of God based on Christ's death on the cross in which a sinner is declared righteous by the transfer of Christ's righteousness. This occurs at the moment of surrendering to Christ. Now, that's kind of like a real theological definition. What I'm trying to say is that because of Christ's death, we are able to, to inherit his righteousness. Let me read this verse for you. It comes from 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. It says this, For our sake he, God, made him Jesus to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of of God. This verse really encapsulates the idea of justification so well. I'll tell you why. God sent Jesus to trade us. Theologians call this the great exchange. What this means is that you and I bring sin, right? All of us are sinners. All of us are not righteous. And we bring that to God. And God gave us his son, Jesus, who was righteous, and we get to trade. We get to trade, not because we offer a really good deal, not because we have anything that Jesus wants or needs, but he trades us because he is gracious. And so because of that, we would get to benefit from Christ's righteousness, meaning that we would be in right standing with God. We would be in right standing with God, even though we did nothing to earn it. And in exchange, Jesus dies and experiences the full wrath of God, the wrath and the punishment that we deserve. You all, that is the gospel, that Jesus would take on our sin, and in return, we would get his righteousness as a gift that we do not deserve, as grace that we do not deserve, that we would experience mercy that we do not deserve. And when we do, we call this justification, and when we are justified, we have been saved. Simply put, if you have put your faith in Jesus, you have been saved. Now, like I said, we probably have a little bit over 100 people in this room tonight, and I know so many of you, I've gotten to like, walk with you in parts of your faith journey. I know so many of you have been saved. But I also know that there's a lot of people in this room that maybe they've grown up around this, maybe they've heard this, maybe their family has been saved, has been justified by Christ, but they have not experienced that for themselves. So stick with me, no matter which camp you are in, because there are two other ways that we're talking about being saved tonight. The next one, present tense. Next we have that we are being saved. Listen closely, because for all of those people that I just said have put their faith in Jesus, this is where you are right now. The problem is a lot of people forget this part. They don't think about this part because they think being saved is this one-step thing. I did that. I prayed a prayer. Maybe I even got baptized. Maybe I talked to a pastor. So I'm done. I did that. Jesus covered me. I have freedom in Christ to do whatever I want to do. The reality is that is not found in Scripture. Instead, we are told that we are still continuously being saved. And a verse that sheds really meaningful light on this topic is 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 13. It says this, But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. Raise your hand if you've ever heard the word sanctification before. That is a churchy word right there. Turn to the person next to you and say sanctification. You got to say it like that, though. Sanctification. There you go. You got that little growl to it, all right? Good. Now I know you guys are with me. All right. Sanctification, I'm going to try to make a really church word a lot more simple. It means you're becoming more like Jesus. This verse, 2 Thessalonians, is saying that God has saved you, 
and is going to continue to save you through sanctification by the Holy Spirit. Many of you know this. You should know this if you are a Christian, that if you have put your faith in Jesus, God has sent his Holy Spirit to dwell inside of your life. Once you have his spirit, the work that the spirit is doing is sanctifying you. You are becoming more like Jesus, and this is a saving work. It leads God's people into acting more like Jesus. It leads them into godliness. I'm going to read you guys kind of a long quote. Stick with me here because I really, really like uh, the way Charles Spurgeon puts it. He says this, Had it been possible for you to have had salvation without sanctification, it would have been a curse to you instead of a blessing. I'm going to stop there. Man, so many people are like, Man, wouldn't it be better if I just got saved and then, like, it was over and I didn't have, like, the possibility of messing this whole thing up? But, but Spurgeon says no. That would not be a blessing. He says, I cannot conceive of a more lamentable condition, something that would be regrettable. You would mourn it. You would be sad about it than for a man to have the happiness of salvation without the holiness of it the holiness of sanctification happily, he says, this is not possible. If you could be saved from the consequences of sin, but not from the sin itself and its power and pollution, it would be no blessing to you. It would be no blessing to you if you could just have the happiness of feeling like, man, Jesus saved me, now I get to do whatever I want. He says, that's not God's will for you. And really, if you are not bearing the evidence of becoming more like Jesus, then you haven't really experienced salvation at all. When we are saved, past tense, justified, we are being saved from the consequences of our sin, hell, and death. But when we are saved through sanctification, we are being saved from sin from sinning in the present tense, a life full of sin. And instead of being in a life full of sin, we are invited into a righteous life, an opportunity where you and I and everybody else who has put their faith in Jesus gets to live a holy life, trying to become more and more like Jesus. And with that comes so much freedom. Being saved is the freedom from sin itself through living like Jesus. If sanctification is too big of a word, you're like, bro, I can't spell that. Just remember this. Being saved, present tense, is the freedom that Christ offers us from sin itself through living like Jesus. God's Spirit leads you into a life where you start to live more and more like Jesus, and there is freedom in that life. Let's go on to what it means to be saved in the future. This one is probably the craziest to think about because it's like, man, if I have been saved and I'm being saved right now, what could I possibly need saving from in the future? But of course, we have uh, verses that shed light on this as well. We see the Apostle Paul talk about this in Romans 5, 8 through 10. Uh, Some of you know I have Romans 5, 8 tattooed on me because it actually is a verse that you would find on a Hobby Lobby sign. It really is the gospel in a verse. It says this, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved, future tense, by him from the wrath of God. Of God, for if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. What this means is that, guys, if God was able to take you when you were so far away from him, when you were dead in your sin, Scripture says you were dead in your sin. If God was able to reconcile you from that place in your life where you were completely dead in sin, then much more is he able to do with you, to glorify you when you have died, to get you into heaven, to save you from his own wrath. Nobody else, not even ourselves, could save us from God's wrath. God had to do that himself through the death and the resurrection of Jesus. It says that we will be saved by his life. We will be saved because of Christ. You all, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. That's the gospel. We have been justified. That's the past tense salvation that we talked about. Much more shall we be saved. We will be in the future. We have been saved from sin, but now that we are dead, it's going to be a time where God is going to judge us, and we would be susceptible to his wrath. We would be 
on trial, we would be able to be punished. But because of the work of Jesus, our salvation is secured in the future as well. Simply put, we will be saved because of Christ. You all, Christians have been saved. If you have put your faith in Jesus, you have been saved. You are being saved right now through sanctification by the Holy Spirit. And the good news is God doesn't stop there. He's not going to leave us here. He will save us in the future. That is a powerful promise. I want to say one more thing that before we close, I don't want you to confuse this with the idea that just because there are stages of salvation, that these are different things. That salvation uh, in the first part, yeah, Jesus did that, but then sanctification, we got to figure that part out. We got to act a certain way, and then hopefully in the future, God will pardon us, and, and that's a whole nother salvation. That's not the case. John Piper says it this way So, whether past, present, or future, we are not talking about three different foundations of salvation, but the different applications of the one achieved foundation Jesus Christ crucified for sinners. I know that we have said a lot of words in the last 15 minutes, and that's on purpose, because from here on out, I just want to give you all an opportunity to respond to the gospel. You all, that is the gospel. There is a foundation where Jesus Christ crucified for sinners and then was resurrected, and because of that, we can have new life in him. The only foundation for you and I to experience salvation, to experience being saved, is Jesus Christ dying and being resurrected. Without Christ, we would experience the pain of being left unsaved. We would experience the destruction that we talked about earlier. It means that we would be destroyed, we would be left to die a spiritual death and experience eternal separation from our Heavenly Father. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. I'm going to say that again. Without Christ, we would be left for dead. We would be unsaved. We would be set for destruction. But God, God is rich in mercy because of the love that he has for you, even when you were dead in your trespasses, when you were dead in your sin. He decided he was going to make us alive in Christ. And by that grace, we are saved. Y'all, I want that to be the story of every single person in this room. That you look back and you know, man, once I was dead in my sin, once I was so far away from God, But God, being rich in his mercy, he saved me. He transformed my life. He saved me. Here's the thing. There's there's really only two groups of people in this room right now. There are those who have been saved, and that means they are in that present tense version of being saved. They are experiencing sanctification. Here's your next step. Become sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Spend time with God. God. Spend time with God's people. Pray. Read scripture. Become more like Jesus and take that mission seriously. That is your role as somebody who is continuously being saved by God. But there's another group in this room that I want to talk to tonight. If you are sitting in this room right now and you're wondering, am I saved? Because that's a question that I asked myself a lot and I would be lying if, I, if sometimes I didn't still have to ask myself, am I saved? And if that's you in this room, know that I'm with you. There are so many believers still asking themselves that question. Did it really work? Am I really saved? But I also remember before I was saved, where I was sitting in a church, in this church actually, but in a different sanctuary, listening to somebody talk about the gospel, and it hit me, and I had this feeling, this sudden feeling, this pit in my stomach where I knew I was lost, where I knew I needed something, where I knew that there was a hole in my heart, and I had this sinking feeling knowing that I was so far away from God. If you are sitting here in this place and you are thinking, am I saved? Have I ever let Jesus change me? Have I ever repented of my sin? All that means is that you've turned away from your sin, and now you are walking with Jesus. If you are sitting in this room and you are having these thoughts, listen closely. 
There is good news for you. It's the same good news that saved me. It's the same good news that saved Tim and Emma and Grace and Erica and all the leaders in this room who love and follow Jesus. It's the same good news that saved the student leaders in this place and, the, and even the, the person that you probably came with. Listen to this. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. If you are sitting in this room wondering how to be saved, if you are saved, and God didn't leave that one up to interpretation. He said if you would believe and confess that my son is Lord, that he died for you. If you would turn away from your old life and you would walk with my son, you will be saved. If you believe and confess with your mouth, you will be saved.